studio that has a lot of toothpicks in, so you have to be careful. <laughs> well, what is this? <laughs> Okay, who made this? Who made this? Debbie, you made this? It's beautiful, but I don't want to venture a guess of what kind of animal it's supposed to be. A hedgehog? Porcupine. Wow. Carolyn, you want to come work us in a refrigerator somewhere? Do not touch. I said do not touch on this. Am I supposed to open this? No. Oh, here, Carolyn. I thought maybe you had a picture of me under there. 246. Let's stand together. That's funny, Debbie. I like that. First and last. Redeemed now I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. His child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed. Water my teeth. Redeem his child and forever I am. Meet and greet time. Shake hands with everybody around you. Make everybody welcome. Take your bulletins. Let me make a couple of announcements real quick for you today. All right, today is Anniversary Sunday. We, our church is now Sweet 16. Pardon me? What'd she say, Louise? She's bashful. Shirley. What? Sing happy birthday of the church? Happy anniversary? Is that what she said? That's not what you said? What did you say? <laughs> Shirley, I'm not married to you. I don't have to put up with that kind of stuff. <laughs> 
We're glad you're here. Uh, today, here's how it's going to go. In just a few moments, we're going to let you play a real quick offertory, Janice, so they can take the um, uh, offering after the announcements, and that's so you guys can get ready. Right after the announcements, we're going to take the offering. Got it, Michael? Okay. Keep, Pat, keep uh, uh, Frank straight back here. Uh, this morning, we are going to have the morning service. The Nineham Four are going to sing, and Delmer is going to preach for us. Then after they're done, we're going outside uh, for the uh, fellowship dinner. Uh, I'm going to encourage you. I've told the folks not to put the food out. Don't get in a rush to put the food out, so nobody leave. It's coming. But if we put the food out real quick, then uh, a lot of folks will eat, and they'll want to go home and not stay for the afternoon service. And the Nine Ham Four are going to be singing again in the afternoon service. You guys stand right there for just a second. Don't do nothing yet. And then uh, there's no evening service. I want you to keep that in mind. I want to remind you to continue to pray for Dr. Bob Hamlin. Uh, he is uh, doing better. I talked to him last night. He's doing some better. So pray for him. How many of you have a bulletin? Let me see. Raise your bulletin. If you have it, let me see it. How many of you know how to read? All right, read the announcements for the week. Teens and, and well, actually, the whole church is invited to go roller skating next Saturday. Uh, leading, meeting at the church at 1.30 going to cost you $5, so you'll be here be ready to go at that time. Adults can come, too. It's for church-wide outing. Uh, if we get a number of people coming, some of you may have to drive, so come expecting to do that. And I think you can see the rest of the announcements there. Please read them. One uh, last mention is we now have a fledgling author in our midst. Butch has written a book called The Struggles of a Christian, and he's going to have a book launch party here at the church at 6 o'clock for Safe Harbor family and friends on Saturday, June the 27th. So you want to be here for that. Read the rest of the announcements. Everything will go good. Michael, lead us in prayer for the offering, please. Amen. Right. We will be taking a love offering for the uh, group at the end of the service this morning, and so you want to be prepared to give to that then. Um, it, it has been a great 16 years here at, at Safe Harbor. Uh, the Lord has blessed us in so many ways, I can't begin to enumerate them, but we've always tried to remind each other of all the blessings God has given to us from almost day one, actually from day one, that this church began. And so I want you to uh, keep that in mind that God has blessed us and it's been a blessing and a, uh, a good blessing because of folks that he's brought our way and, and been part of the ministry. We've seen people saved. Uh, we've seen folks that have gotten back together as far as, far as uh, on the brink of divorce. Uh, we've seen miraculous miracles as far as medical healings and things taking place. Uh, we're not, don't, I'm not a healer by any stretch of the imagination, but we do believe that God can heal anybody of anything at any time as he chooses. And through prayer, we've seen that happen at our church numerous times. So I, I'm, I'm thrilled. I want to say proud, but that's the wrong word. I'm thrilled to have a part in it. And I'm thrilled that you folks are so kind to me. I'm thrilled that Debbie gave me those toothpicks on there that are blunt on one end. Uh, that, that cuts my chances of injuring myself by 50% on each toothpick. So, Well, the Nottingham Four are with us. I mentioned in Sunday school we've tried 16 years to get them and have never been able to book them until this year, and we're so glad that we could get them. I've known Delmer for a lot of years. I don't even know if he remembers this or not, but I was cutting grass one time, got stuck in a ditch, and he come along. He was delivering mail and backed up to my tractor and threw a line on it and pulled me out and went right on delivering the mail. He's, he's been a, a, a guy that I've known for a lot of years. So we're going to have them come. Uh, he kept asking me, how much time do I have? I said, well, depends on how long you're going to preach. 
Whatever time you're going to preach, you subtract that, and that's how much time you have to sing. So I hope they sing a good bit. Hope they sing a song that makes you cry before the day's over. They've already attempted it with me, and I held off. Delmer, you folks come. We're glad to have you with us. After the music portion of the service, this is how it's going to go. Delmer, you need to uh, let them have a break just long enough to take the kids to junior church while you're preaching. If you'll kind of stop for a minute and take a breath and say, get out of here, you brat. <laughs> I'm sorry. Amen. It is a joy to be here this morning and uh, be here with you folks for your anniversary Sunday. Now, it's never a good thing when the preacher pulls out two bottles of water, so uh, don't worry about it. This one's almost empty, all right? But it is a joy to be here with you, and uh, we pray the Lord will bless your heart. Sixteen years, that's, uh, that's amazing. Time flies by so quickly. Seems like just a few years ago that uh, you were down at State Line, and uh, uh, was that where I pulled you out? I, I'd forgotten all about that. Uh, how, old uh, are you now? how old am I? I'm 58. I'll be 59 in a month or so. <laughs> yeah, but if you knew how many people I pulled out on the mail route, uh, tractors, and uh, uh, one day uh, even the state road truck was stuck in the ditch, and they were waiting for a big grader to come. I said, you don't need a big grader. I said, give me a chain. They said, well, that little old Jeep. And I had a little old Jeep, and it was gray, and it looked like the mouse pulling the elephant, but I pulled that truck out of the ditch. And uh, so a lot of that I've done, but it's good to be here today. And uh, I don't deliver mail anymore. Thank God he delivered me from that. And so uh, I told him after 34 years of good behavior, they let me out. And so... Uh, uh, my sentence is done there, and uh, just a privilege to be able to travel and sing uh, with these guys and my wife that the Lord has given us. We're going to start off with a song that Ronnie's going to do, and it's an old, old song in Southern Gospel music, and I'm sure you know it and sing along with us. Never been this homesick before.
uh, this is homecoming, right? And anniversary Sunday. So uh, a lot of things take place in our lives, but it's always good to go back to home and what's familiar. And uh, uh, I want, uh, talking about home, and uh, many of you have kept up with uh, uh, the quest that uh, our daughter and son in law have been involved with in the last two and a half, almost three years. And uh, um, my, our daughter Andrea and son-in-law Michael have been trying to adopt a little boy from Honduras. Started when he was two years old and he'll be five in October. And uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, you know, we always say God's timing is not our timing, right? And we prayed and prayed and prayed that the Lord would allow this adoption to take place. They were actually denied uh, this adoption and there was no no reason why so they got a new lawyer and then did an appeal and uh, the lawyer said there's no reason why this adoption not have, should have not gone through and talked to people on the board and they said we don't understand it and so an appeal was made and finally it kept going through and through and and uh, you know when you're on island time even though they're not on an island if you know what I mean by that uh, they uh, uh, they just don't have a sense of time all right and uh, they just don't seem to care. And things just kept dragging on. And usually towards the end of the week, I'd start saying to my wife, have you heard anything from Andrea? Have they heard from down there? Has the adoption been okay? And another week would go by and we wouldn't hear anything. And uh, uh, back in, uh, what, the third week of May, on a Sunday morning, my, our daughter had had her phone out of her pocketbook and just had it laying on the, on the, uh, uh, the church bench there. And uh, wasn't using it or anything like that. Uh, probably our granddaughter had been messing with her phone or something like that. But anyway, it was laying there on the, on the uh, bench, and she saw her phone light up. And here was, it was a text message coming from the missionary's wife down in Honduras. And she thought, well, i got to look at this coming from her. And it said something along the line. Come and get your boy. The adoption has been granted. And uh, so uh, he's coming home. And we really want you to pray for them because on Tuesday, uh, Michael and Andrea will be leaving to go to Honduras. And they could be down there as much as a month trying to get this paperwork finalized. So pray for them. But David, the big brother, is going to sing a song for you right now that says, No Longer an Orphan. And I'm so glad that I can say that I'm not an orphan anymore. I've been adopted into the family, been born again. But uh, this song is just really special for us right now. No longer an orphan.
do beyond the ring. I gotta say something before we do this song. Um, I was thinking about this the whole way over, and I was uh, debating whether or not even to, to say something this morning. Um, not one for opening old wounds, but uh, last time I was here, uh, for a revival service, I believe it was maybe about two years ago, and uh, there was one gentleman here at that time that's not here this morning, and uh, it's bothered me a lot. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been a while now. Uh, he was a man that, as the Bible says, mark yourself a good man, mark yourself a righteous man. Mr. Houston was, was that for me. You know, I didn't know him probably nearly as well as most of you in here knew him, but I knew him, and I knew he was a godly man. I knew he loved his, his God. I knew he loved his church, his kids, his grandkids, his pastor, his wife. And uh, he was very dear to me. And he's, of course, as, as you know, he's going on, and he's going in a place that I'm going to sing about beyond the rain.
just feel like we ought to sing one together this morning. And I think it ought to be a good old hymn. And uh, I want us to do Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And I want us to do it just good and slow and, and just to really think about the words of this song. Because it is amazing what God has done for us. It's amazing that he could love sinners such as we are. And it's amazing that he would be mindful of somebody like me. So as we sing Amazing Grace, let's just sing it and lift up our voices to him. Amazing Grace. song this morning before I bring the word of God and I want you to stay here for this afternoon got some really great songs we want to share with you and got some really special announcements that I need to share with you but for the sake of time uh, you just hang around here for this afternoon preachers already talked about how good the food's going to be and so if you don't hang around if you don't stay for the afternoon service don't eat no I'm just kidding <laughs> all right but please stay because we really we really want to share with you the ministry that God's given us and just the exciting things he's been doing and what he's getting ready to do this summer. So uh, uh, please stay here with us. And uh, the song that we're getting ready to do is one that David sings. And uh, uh, I tell you, I love this song. It's an older song. And uh, David's mother, our daughter, came to us back in uh, uh, sometime before Easter. And we were getting ready to do a, a Easter program there at the church Easter pageant that she had put together she wrote most of the script and and and, uh, and she planned on different groups singing different songs and we were getting ready to go do a new recording which we have there our brand new recording is back and uh, uh, we'll be doing the title of that song later the or title of the CD later this afternoon and uh, but she wanted us to learn this song and the song is called his life for mine and so we were working on this new CD, and it just meant that we were learning uh, four new songs already. And if you know the Nottingham Four over the years, if we could learn one new song at a time, we were doing well. And uh, uh, for us to be doing four new songs, and then she gave us another song, so five new songs we were trying to learn at one time. And now, I, I get, I'm old. I get confused. I forget which part I'm supposed to be doing. I look at David, and I'd say... Uh, Am I singing the, the lower harmony or are you singing the lower harmony? And you still confused? 
And, uh, hey, don't, don't talk to me like that. You're the one who forgets the words all the time. And uh, he's not as old as I am. But, <laughs> but um, we, we started practicing this song. And we, wanted to say, we had to sing it for the Easter program on Easter Sunday morning. And uh, before Easter, we went out to sing one night. And we said, well, let's sing that song so that we know we've got it ready for the Easter program. And we sang that song. And on the way home, Mike says, I don't know about you guys. He says, but that has to go on the new CD. And every one of us said, yes, it does. And I pray this song will bless your heart. His life for mine. You think about the fact that he was willing to come and give his life so freely that we might be saved and might be forgiven. I pray to bless your heart, his life for mine. <laughs> Pastor said to give an opportunity for the youth to uh, go to junior church, and so 
I don't know who's going to preach if I have to go to junior church. And uh, you've probably used that one before, right? <laughs> All right. I, th I don't think he wants to go. And <laughs> Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua. And uh, we'll be in Joshua chapter 2 this morning. Joshua chapter 2. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 2. <clears throat> and I know this is a very familiar passage of Scripture from the Word of God, but I, I love the Old Testament. I love to study in the Old Testament. I love to preach out of the Old Testament. Because what is founded in the Old Testament is uh, estab it's established in the Old Testament and it's completed in the New. And uh, I love uh, the Old Testament. But here in the book of Joshua, chapter 2, we find that the children of Israel have come out of the uh, bondage of Egypt. And uh, now Moses has led them. And uh, Moses has come to the end of his life. And Joshua has become the leader. And now they, ha are, they have crossed over the river of uh, uh, Jor the Jordan River and they've come to Jericho. And we know the story very well of the walls that uh, uh, would fall down flat. And here uh, we find this story, this passage deals with uh, the spies that go in to, uh, to discover the city. And so if you found Joshua chapter 2, if you'd stand please. <coughs> For the reading of the word of God in honor of the word. And in verse 1 of chapter 2 of the book of Joshua, it says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy even, uh, secretly, saying, uh, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thy house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of shutting the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after, after them by the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. Now, I want you to look here. Uh, and in verse 8 it says, And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord, now look at that, L-O-R-D, capitalized, every one of them. That means Jehovah. I know that Jehovah hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord, once again, all capitalized, dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. When ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord capitalized once again your God. He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now we're going to stop reading there, but keep your Bible open because we will be looking at other verses this morning. But I'd like to preach to you for just a few moments on the scarlet line, the scarlet line. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Father, for the privilege to be in your house this morning. And Lord, for what our hearts have already felt. And I pray that right now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will just settle in among us, that you'll move upon our hearts in a great and in a mighty way. Lord, if there's one here today, maybe even two, 
that do not know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray that your sweet Holy Spirit will convict them deeper than sin has ever stained. I pray that the power of God would rest upon their heart today, and that today on this anniversary Sunday, uh, Lord, that they would come and give their heart and life to you and be saved by your marvelous grace, and this would start a yearly anniversary in their life. And so, Father, I pray that you'll move upon their hearts. But Lord, I pray for us as your children that have been saved and we know that we're born again. I pray that your spirit will move upon our hearts. And Lord, if there's anything that's displeasing, anything that's wrong in our life today, that you'll convict us of it, that we'll repent. And Lord, I pray that we just see a spirit of revival upon our hearts here today. Thank you, Lord, for that scarlet line, for the precious blood uh, that saves from sins. And Lord, I pray that you'll just move upon our hearts here today. Lord, give me the very words. Give me strength in my voice. And I pray, Father, that I will say exactly what you put on my heart, no more, no less. And Lord, that I'll be found pleasing to you. In your name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Here, as I've already said, this is a very uh, familiar passage of Scripture. But when we talk about Rahab, if you think about Rahab, she had a classification in life. No matter what you read about her or how you think about Rahab, there are always two words that follow her name because it's Rahab the harlot. That's how she's known. And that was her classification in life. Uh, in the town of Jericho, if there were any uh, women that started talking on the street and they would talk about Rahab, I guarantee you the, the next two words would always follow, you know Rahab, that old harlot that lives on such and such street or lives over there by uh, so-and-so's house. She was known, that was her classification in life. And you know, all of us, we have classifications in life. Sometimes it has to do with our occupation. Uh, Brother Gary's known as pastor uh, uh, here of Safe Harbor Baptist Church. Now, before he was pastor of Safe Harbor Baptist Church, I knew him as the, uh, uh, as the dry cleaner guy and the cleaning business, and I, I knew him that way and because of uh, being there in Rising Sun. But we have uh, a classification in life. Uh, I was known as the mailman. I still uh, have people today say, there's my mailman. And, the, and then the next few words come. Boy, we sure miss you because the mail service is such a mess. Don't blame the mailman. Blame the postal service in general, all right? But uh, 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 th that's what I was known as uh, because that was my secular job. And when I go to different churches, they'll say, there's the preacher and or there's the singer, depending on where we've been traveling. And I got a classification in life. Uh, the thing that I want to make sure is that my classification is a good classification. I don't want my classification to be like Rahab's classification was because she was known as the harlot. And so uh, she, no doubt she was scorned by the wives of uh, many men there in that city. Uh, but I really believe that, uh, that Rahab knew very well her classification in life. I believe she knew she was a sinner. And you say, well, why do you think that? Because of reading the context of the scripture and reading uh, how she talks with these men and talking about the Lord, uh, the Jehovah, that she knew full well. Matter of fact, if you read there in verse, uh, uh, in the different verses, you're going to find out uh, that Rahab talks and refers to the Lord God of heaven many, many times. And, and she, in verse 9, she says, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. She had a conviction. Rahab not only had a classification in life, but I believe she knew that she was a sinner, and I believe that she knew she needed a change in her life. Because when Rahab met these men, or they came to her house, she had a conviction about who God was. She does not refer to them as their God. At one point, she does say, your God. But she's referring about God of heaven in the sense of, I know who he is. I know that he's the great God of heaven. I know that he is Jehovah. How many people do you run into in your life? Uh, you, those of you who are born again, and you talk to them about God. You talk to them about heaven. And they'll say, oh, I believe there's a God. 
Uh, we hear that all the time. You try to talk to someone about the Lord. Oh yeah, I believe there's a God. I, I, I believe in heaven and, and, and I believe there's a God. I, I'm a Christian, but you know what? Do they really believe that God is truly God? Hey, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've got a question in your heart and in your mind about whether God is truly God. Man, look at history. Look at the Word of God in comparison with history. Look at science in comparison with the Word of God. And you can come to no other conclusion that the God of heaven who inspired this holy Word it truly is God and He is God alone as it says in the book of Isaiah time and time again. He said, I am God and there is none else. Oh, we have uh, uh, the mentality all around us that you could see God, uh, 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 you can worship this God or that God, and we live in the United States of America. You can worship just about any God that you want to worship. But the fact of it is, it does not make it real that you are worshiping the true and the almighty God. And I see here, that Rahab had a classification in life, but she had a conviction about who God was. If you look here uh, in, verse, uh, uh, in verse 9, it says, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. She doesn't say, I know that you're Lord. She says, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that the terror, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. It says, for we have heard how the Lord, and capitalize again, dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. Talks about how that, uh, what they did to the kings through the power of Almighty God. She realizes all of this, but in verse 11, I love this passage. She says, and as soon as we heard these things, our heart did melt. Do you think maybe that was the point that Rahab said? He is God. I, I, there is no God that can do something like this. There is no other God that we serve or that we worship here that could do something like this. She said our hearts did melt. I believe maybe Rahab's heart melted in the sense of, yeah, he is God. I need that God. I want that God. Because you see, at the very first opportunity, when the men came to her, she didn't send them away. She didn't say, uh-uh, I have nothing to do with this. Man, I could be killed for allowing you to come into my house. I'm not hiding you. I'm not preserving your life. But no, instead, Rahab, she relishes the moment where she can take them in, where she can protect these men. And look at what she does here. We see here, and, and, and it says, our heart, it says, uh, didn't melt. Fear fell upon us. It says in verse 11, neither did there remain any more courage in any man. You know what? When, when people hear something like that, and, and, and everybody is scared to death, it's pretty evident that the power of God was real and that he's working in hearts and in lives. How long has it been since you saw a song? an old-fashioned Holy Spirit revival where the fear of God fell upon hearts, where the power of God fell in conviction. Man, we live in a day when people don't fear God. We live in a day when they say, oh, he's just a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He'll, he'll, he'll understand my sin. He'll, uh, you know, uh, there's no judgment of God. Folks, I want to tell you, God is still God. And right now we live in a day of grace. We live in an age of where we can confess and repent. But there's coming a day when God is going to be a God of judgment, when there will be no more opportunity to repent. He is almighty God, and we should fear him. We should reverence him as the great God of heaven. Man, we as Christians, we get uh, these little pet sins in our lives, and we think, well, you know, the Lord understands, and, 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 and you know, he's not going to judge me. Well, where'd that come from? He is going to judge us. There are things in our lives that we're going to give an account for. Why do you think that we will stand in judgment when this life is over? Because there are things, even though we've been saved by the grace of God, that we've got to give account for. And so, folks, it's time we realize as Christians we've got to come clean. 
We've got to realize that if there's going to be revival, if the power of God is going to work in our life and in our churches, we've got to come clean. We've got to fear and to reverence Almighty God. But uh, uh, Rahab says to the men, there, were no, there was no more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Man, is there any better testimony than that to say he's God in heaven above, he's God in the earth beneath, that he's God anywhere you go? It, it, can you have a better testimony of what, uh, how you believe in Almighty God? I don't think it gets any better than that, than to say he's God anywhere you go, that he's God anything you do. He is God no matter what. Boy, if we just realize that as Christians, I think that it would become more of a reality to us that no matter what storm, no matter what difficulty, no matter what trial in our life, if we would just say, hey, he's God in heaven, he's God below, he's God in the good times, he's God in the bad times, he's God in the midst of the storm, he's God in the midst of a beautiful, sunny, breezy day, he's God no matter what. Man, we've got to realize that we've got to turn to him and trust him and believe him for the storms and the trials and the victories that we need to accomplish in our life. But you see, God's reputation went before the men. Aren't you glad it's not your reputation you're leaning on as you serve him? Aren't you glad that it's his reputation? Because if I were to lean on my reputation, it, it'd be bad. It, it just wouldn't be good. Because I want to tell you, I've faltered, I've failed, I've sinned against the Lord. I've let down in so many ways, but he's never failed. He's never let me down. He's never discouraged me. He's never left me forsaken. He's God and he will always be God. And so when I talk to somebody about Jesus Christ, and I talk to them about their problem or their need of salvation. I'm glad that on the reputation of Almighty God, I can say he's God no matter what. He's God. He can save you. He can cleanse you. He'll never let you down. He'll never forsake you. And friend, aren't you glad that we serve a God like that? Because if I had a God that I served that uh, sometimes I could count on him and sometimes I couldn't, I just wouldn't serve him. But aren't you glad we got a God that we can serve no matter what storm, no matter what trial, no matter what difficulty in our life? He's God and he will forever be God. Man, I look at this and I got to hurry. It says, uh, uh, when, you know, when they started over Jordan, just as it did when, the Red, when they went through the Red Sea, the waters rolled back there. So can you imagine the inhabitants of Jordan? Now, they didn't get to see the Red Sea. They had heard about what God did. They had heard about how the waters rolled back. But when the priest bearing the ark stepped down into the waters of Jordan and the waters rolled back and the children of Israel went across the river Jordan on dry ground, can you imagine those people that were there in Jordan or maybe the spies that they had sent out and they came running back and they said, hey, 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 God did it again. The, the waters rolled back and they came through the river on dry ground. Can you imagine, even though they'd heard all that story about the Red Sea and how that their hearts already were fearful and were melting, when the news came back that Jordan had rolled back and that they're out there putting rocks in the middle of the water, they're doing something, and that's a different message. You need to read that. But anyway, and putting rocks on the bank and, and, there, and, and, and the water rolled back and, and when the priests, those guys carrying the, uh, the ark uh, on their shoulders, when they came out by the water, the water came back. Can you imagine the fear that overwhelmed the people of Jericho? Rahab is waiting for the opportunity waiting for the opportunity. And God sent those men to her house. Rahab had conviction, but Rahab took care of the spies. Because if you look here in this passage, it says in verse 
6. She brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax. And by the way, do you know what the name Rahab means? It means wide. Rahab, the name means wide. And her lifestyle was one that fits exactly uh, what the Word of God says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13. That wide is the, uh, uh, the, the way that leadeth to destruction. But the gate is narrow that leadeth unto life everlasting. Amen? And her lifestyle was wide. It was a wicked lifestyle. And, but here we see that when she led them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, you know what she did? She covered them with the flax, these stalks of flax. But flax was something that was used in that day. They would strip it apart, and they used it as thread. And they would sew, and they would use it to make clothes and sew clothes together or to weave whatever they needed to do. And she not only covered them with that flax to protect them, but what a picture we find of the covering of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his precious blood that shed for us that we might be forgiven of our sins. But she covered them. She protected them. But how many of us are willing to have a covering of prayer over our pastor, over our deacons, over our church, over our teachers, how many of us are willing to have a covering over our family, over our loved ones? Man, I tell you, I get up in the morning and my prayer is, Lord, would you watch over my family today? Put your hedge about them and protect them. Keep them from the evil one. Keep the evil one from them. And Lord, uh, for those little ones that are not yet saved, oh Lord, would you touch their heart? Would you convict them? Would you save them at an early age? You say, do you pray that prayer, uh, uh, that same kind of prayer? Yeah, you better believe it. I, I repeat that prayer and I ask the Lord to touch my family because I I want that covering upon them. Man, old Job prayed for his family. He sacrificed for his family because he wanted them protected. And I want to tell you, we need that covering. We need that covering for our family, for our churches. We need. But Rahab cared for the spies. She took them up there and she it was determined that they were not going to hurt, it, it, uh, be hurt. Look here in verse 13. Or in verse 12, I'm sorry. It says, now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will show uh, kindness also, uh, or show unto my, uh, will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, a true token of your faith and of your, uh, uh, your promise to me that no hurt will come to me and my family. Verse 13, she says, Save alive my father, my mother, and my brother, and my sisters. In verse 14, the men make a statement. I'm trying to hurry here. They, the men answered her, Our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. You see, the rest of the story here is the fact that after the men had stayed there, in verse 18, she let them down by the wall with a scarlet line. And the men said to her, said, you take that scarlet line and you embroider it or you put it in this window and it'll be the true token of the protection of your family. But don't go outside of the house because whoever goes out, his blood will be on his own head. But we see here that there, Rahab had a covenant with the spies. And these men said to her, our life for yours. You see, Rahab could have died. She could have died because if the king knew for sure that she had harbored those spies and that she had protected them, her life would have been over. But instead, these men's lives were preserved and they said, our life for yours. Said, we're going to save you alive. 
And you say, well, Delmer, what's this have to do with homecoming? You see, Rahab lived in Jericho. She was the harlot there. But when these men and their armies of Israel came, and Jericho was defeated, and the walls fell down flat, and the Israelites were victorious. You know who was saved alive and her family? Rahab and her family was saved alive. And God had a plan for Rahab's life. Because if you read in the book of Matthew, in the genealogy of uh, Joseph's family, you're going to find out, well, I won't read it to you. It's in uh, Matthew chapter 1. But you're going to find out that Rahab, who used to be the harlot in Jericho, is now in the family line of uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly father, and she is in the bloodline of Joseph. She is in the bloodline of David. Now, isn't that amazing how God has a plan and how that he can take someone who was classified as the harlot over in Jericho and put her in uh, to uh, uh, that family line of David and of Joseph. Man, our God's good, isn't he? But her heart melted over who God was and what he had done and what he was going to do because she knew full well. She said, I know, I know that the Lord hath delivered you into our hands. Folks, do you believe him today? Have you got a battle in your life? Have you got a storm in your life as a child of God? Is there a difficulty that's taking place in your life right now today? And you know that if God does not intervene and if God does not take charge of it, you're going to make a mess. You're going to get it all out of whack. And he's the one that's got to do it. You see, he can do it. He has the power. He's almighty God. He's God in heaven above. He's God in earth beneath. He's God in the good times. He's God in the bad times. But you see, Rahab found a home. She started traveling. She left Jericho. But what a story that there is with Rahab, who used to be the harlot, because now her life is changed totally. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask the quartet to come back and to sing song of invitation <clears throat> the scarlet line the scarlet line of the blood of Jesus Christ well the word of God says without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins and I'm so glad that he was willing to shed that precious blood for you and I do you know him? Do you know him as your Lord and Savior today? As heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one's looking around, Pat begins to play softly. I wonder if there might be one here this, this afternoon. You'd say, preacher, I'm just not sure that I'm saved. I'm just not, I don't have that confidence in my heart. To know that if I were to die this very day, that heaven would be my eternal home. I don't have that confidence. I don't have that assurance in my heart, in my mind, in my life. And I, I want God's people to pray for me. Because I want to know. I wonder if there would be one, just put your hand up and, and then take it right back down. I'm not coming to you. I'm not going to embarrass you other than to say we're going to pray for you. Is there one quickly? You're not sure. You don't have that confidence in your heart. The word of God's very clear that if we come, we confess our sin, that God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, we can count on his word. We can trust him. We can believe him because he is God in heaven above. He is God in the earth beneath. He's God anywhere you go. How about it, dear friend? God's working on your heart. And you know right now I'm speaking to you because God the Holy Spirit has already been pointing it out to you that you're not ready. 
Is there one that would slip their hand up and just take it right back down? Let us pray for you. You're not saved and you want God's people to pray. Is there one quickly? I wonder how many Christians this morning you'd say, Brother Delmer, God's speaking to my heart today. And there are burdens. There are cares that I'm encountering right now. And, and I know that I've got to trust Him. But my faith has been weak. And God's dealt with my heart today. Help me pray about it. How many Christians, be honest, just slip their hand up and say, pray for me. Pray with me about my need, my burden. Is there one quickly that would be honest? Slip your hand up. We're not coming to you. We want to pray. We want to have that privilege of prayer. Is there one quickly? Is there one? Father, we come before you, and you know the need of every heart. I pray as the fellows sing that you'll speak. Move upon hearts. In your name we ask it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you stand, please, while the fellows sing? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Do you know him today? Are you ready for heaven? How about it, Christian? Do you need to be here? Do you need to be at this altar today? Is there one quickly? The fellows are going to sing one more verse. And then Pastor Gilbert come and do as the Lord puts on his heart but do you know him Thank you.